Lee Mandel, and I'm president of the Board of Trustees of the Homeless Empowerment Project, the publisher of Spare Change News. I want to thank everybody for coming out to hear this public forum, Is There Hope in This Desperate Time, featuring Dr. Howard Zinn and Dr. Noam Chomsky. The Homeless Empowerment Project has been helping people who have become homeless or in danger of becoming homeless since 1992. We do this by offering a path of employment without barriers. We help people develop the skills to be their own boss, make their own decisions, and be in control of their lives. We provide employment opportunities for vendors selling spare change news, writers for the paper, along with distribution and office help. I'm very proud to be a part of this organization for over 10 years. As a small example of the work we still have to do, I have a story about advertising this event. As I usually do, I sent out many email announcements about this event to every list that I know, and probably some more. Here's one response that both infuriated and motivated me. Quote, these two clowns have been promoting their socialist crap since I was in college. <laughs> They apparently haven't learned a thing from all the history that's happened in between. I have no more desire to fund them than I do to fund any of the professional bums who sell spare change news on the street. <laughs> As you can see, despite all of the good work we and many other organizations and individuals have done, there is still much to do educating people and dispelling myths. This event is a fundraiser for the Homeless Empowerment Project. If you'd like more information about our organization, please sign up on the forms that are on the table as you walked in. You can also talk to any of the folks with badges on, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, also, uh, we have copies of Howard Zinn's new book, Voices of a People's History of the United States, for sale. And Howard has graciously said that he will be signing the books after the event. I would li now like to hand the microphone over to Paula Matthew. Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming out and finding the room here. We almost didn't. Um, I, I, my name's Paula Matthew, and Fran, the director of Spare Change, asked me to introduce the speakers tonight, which is both daunting and in some ways unnecessary because you're all here, so you're here for a reason, but I'll go ahead and do it anyhow. Um, it's hard to introduce two people whose breadth of work and commitments um, are as ambitious and accomplished as Howard Zinn's and Noam Chomsky's. I was doing some research, and you could literally spend the better part of your lifetime reading the work prepared by the, tonight's speakers. Um, I think Dr. Chomsky has about 60 books. Is that an accurate count? <laughs> um, and it's just amazing. And, um, and it's really a testament to, to both of these men that they agreed to take part in this very small event for a very small organization tonight. And, and the Homeless Empowerment Project is truly privileged to have you both here. So thank you very much and welcome to you both. I think it's really a testament to really defining, in the finest sense of the word, what it means to be a public intellectual. Um, our speakers will speak in turn, and they're very familiar with each other, so they won't need our moderating in any way. So just a couple of quick words. Um, it's hard for me to introduce Howard Zinn without gushing a little bit, because he's really a personal hero. Um, most people know him as the best-selling author of People's History of the United States, a book that has sold more than a million copies worldwide and continues to increase in sales every year. Pretty amazing. And, um, but there's much more about Zinn's career. Um, People's History was published in 1980, and he had completed graduate school in the late 1950s. And long before and after its publication, Zinn has been an agitator and activist, maintaining throughout all his endeavors um, I think a, a wonderful zen-like smile, coupled with what Marion Edelman, Wright Edelman calls an unprecedented capacity for moral outrage, which I just think is great. Uh, whether it was a shipyard worker, soldier, history professor, or activist, Zinn has devoted his life to achieving justice with struggle but without war. 
And just to plug the documentary that was just released this summer about his life, Howard Zane, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train, it's, it's an amazing documentary, and I think it'll be out on DVD soon. Our second speaker, Noam Chomsky, I think I, I started writing, I just started writing lists. Philosophy, ethics, foreign policy, propaganda, mass media, political economy, education, US foreign policy, the rule of law, and let's not forget linguistics. <laughs> There's barely a topic of contemporary concern that Noam Chomsky hasn't written extensively about in a manner that is at the same time erudite, radical, and clear. He's Institute Professor of Linguistics at MIT, one of the most quoted educators in history, I learned today, um, right up there with like Plato and uh, <laughs> other folks. And, and when I did a search on him, he gets 293,000 hits on Google, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, some of those hits are because people hate him. So, um, <laughs> but loved or hated, he certainly never ignored. So I'm happy to turn the panel over to our speakers. And I think Dr. Zinn, you're going to speak first tonight. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, I'm still working on matching that number of hits. <laughs> you know, I tune in on Google every hour to see how many hits I have, and I, I'm, I'm still not making it. You know, and as for the 60 books, that's asking too much, <laughs> really. Uh, but. Uh, I asked Noam as we were coming in, do you realize what the topic is tonight? <laughs> uh, do you know what the topic is tonight? Yes. Yeah? I was hoping you'd forget. <laughs> it has something to do with hope, right? Uh, right? How can we be hopeful in desperate times? Uh, so maybe we should like divide the work. I'll talk about the hopeful. And no one will talk about desperate. <laughs> but uh, actually, that question comes up again and again. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure Noam faces it all the time, and I face it all the time, and you probably face it all the time, right? Because if you're like me, you have a lot of friends who are depressed. A lot of friends who go around very gloomy think the world is coming to an end. Uh, Bush is in office. <laughs> Ashcroft is there. Rumsfeld is there. You turn on the television, and those are the only faces you see. And you turn from channel to channel to channel, and you see the same faces again. Then you turn TV off, and the faces are still there. <laughs> See, it's very, we're living in very spooky times, yeah. And uh, you can understand people feeling depressed. You can understand people feeling desperate. Because the truth is that this is probably the most dangerous administration, most dangerous presidency that we have had. Uh, you know, somebody said to me, since Harding? And I said, Harding? Are you kidding? Harding was a nice guy. <laughs> uh, he pardoned Eugene Debs. No, it goes back, back, far. Maybe, well, no one was just talking to me about Ahab in the Bible. Maybe it goes back to Ahab, <laughs> you see. But uh, no, we're faced with evil. Uh, it's not that we haven't had bad presidents. In fact, that's hardly all that we've had. You know, Republicans, Democrats, they get us into wars, they take the resources of the country and they, they pour it into the military budget, and uh, you know, the Democrats are a little better at giving a little more money to people for health care and, and you know, for uh, education and so on. But you know, fundamentally, from the, from the very beginning of this country, you know, the, the the nation has been in the hands 
of the rich, of the elite, and, and they have uh, controlled the legislation. I mean, you could, all you have to do is look at the, the very first pieces of legislation uh, uh, that were passed by the very first Congress passing Alexander Hamilton's economic program, you know, and it's a program that favors the rich, it favors the bankers, it makes a connection between the banks and the United States, it taxes the farmers in order to pay off the bondholders. It sounds very familiar. Uh, and you follow the line all the way up down to the present, you know. And, uh, and of course, the, sure, the imperial adventures of the Bush administration, two wars in three years, uh, that's, you know, he's trying to set a record. Two wars in three years. He seems to have missed a year. Uh, but uh, in fact, American foreign policy has been aggressive and imperialist for a very long time, very long time. It was expansionist immediately starting right after the Revolutionary War uh, and has continued right up to the present day. And it didn't matter whether we had liberals in the White House or conservatives in the White House. It didn't matter whether we had Democrats or Republicans. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not as if you know, Bush is an a absolute uh, turnabout from what we've had before. It's just a, an especially evil extension of what we've always faced in this country. Uh, but, uh, and so in a situation like this, you know, uh, can you talk about hope? Uh, yes, you can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you can even feel it. You can even suggest it. Not, not, because we're, not because we expect anything immediate to happen that will reverse the direction of American foreign policy or reverse the direction of American national policy. No, I, I, if you talk about being hopeful, you, it's not a good idea to talk about something that you expect immediately. Hope can only come if you have some perspective, some historical perspective, if you think in long terms, if you're willing to be patient, and I don't mean patient in the passive sense. I mean patient sitting by and, and waiting and hoping the good things happen. No, patient in the sense of being active and persistent and continuing and going on and on and on, even when things look gloomy, you know. And, and the reason you can have a hope uh, in, uh, in a situation like that is if you have some historical perspective, you know that there have been other times in American history in which people have felt as, yeah, as desperate as people today. And I mean, there was a time when it, the people who were opposed to slavery in this country uh, had no hope that slavery would be abolished. Because not only was slavery so deeply, deeply rooted in, the, in this country in the South, and also in the North, by the way, and not only that, but the national government, right up to Abraham Lincoln, did not seem eager to do anything about slavery. I mean, they were people on their own. You were the black slaves on their own, except for what's at first was a handful of agitators in the North, abolitionists, black and white, and it seemed like an impossible task that slavery you know, would be overthrown, but it was. You know. And we've seen this again and again historically you know, in this country. You know. And the, the labor movement has had to fight against enormous odds. Working people have gone through tremendous grievances for a long, long time, and we're not getting any help. The, the, they were not getting any help from, uh, from Congress or from the Supreme Court or from the president. Uh, the the eight-hour day was not won because Congress passed a law, or because the president issued a decree, or because of a Supreme Court decision. The eight-hour day was won uh, because working people persisted, in spite of the fact that their situation seemed desperate, in spite of the fact that, the, that you know, they didn't look very hopeful for them. They had nobody on their side except themselves. But what they found out was that, that themselves, if they organized, if they stuck together, if they persisted, if they took risks, if they went out on strike, if they boycotted, if they were, were willing to go to jail, if they were willing to lose their jobs, 
Uh, and if they stuck at it and stuck at it and stuck at it, yes, at some point, yeah, they would win the eight-hour eight day. At some point, things would change. And of course, we've seen that in recent decades. We've seen the, the and, and I, I myself personally, and maybe you too, living in this, you, living in this era, you know, and uh, I, I was living in the South in the 19, late 1950s, early 60s, living, teaching in a black college, living in a black community, and becoming involved in the civil rights movement. If you looked at the South in the late 18, 19, late 1950s, well, it looked hopeless. And what happened? People persisted. Black people in the South tried again and again and again to, to break into that ironclad wall of segregation, and again and again they failed. Again and again they were beaten or killed. Uh, if they tried to register to vote or tried to go to some place where they weren't supposed to be. And then at a certain point in history, a few young people did something in, in the spring of uh, in the early part of 1960, and it caught on. And so that's what happens. Things, you, you do something, you do something, it fails, it fails a hundred times, and then it catches on. And when it catches on, other people begin to do the same, and more people begin to do the same, and then you have a movement. And the South, although all the power was on the other side, and the federal government was not doing anything to help black people in the South. Uh, and despite the Constitution, despite the 14th and 15th Amendments and, and all the promises of that, that, no president was enforcing those amendments. And so black people in the South had to do it by themselves, and they did. And they persisted. They didn't give up. And, and the South was transformed. Not enough, of course. No, nothing is ever transformed enough, you see, nothing. But yeah, South is different now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and, and we, those of us who remember the anti-war movement and, and how, uh, well, how hopeless it seemed. I remember uh, our first you know, anti-war rally on the Boston Common in the spring of 1965. Uh, Anti-war rally, Boston Common. Uh, about a hundred people showed up. Uh, yeah. A few years later, in the Boston Common, a hundred thousand people showed up. Uh, people persisted. Uh, people did not give up. You know, and so, well, uh, you know, we're in one of those periods when people very often ask me, well, well, how would you compare the situation today with the situation in the anti-war movement or the civil rights movement? I say, well, look, you're thinking of those movements at their height. Think of those movements at their beginning. Think of how it looked when those movements started out. That's how it looks now, uh, except that we're actually ahead of them in many ways. Because despite all the, you, what you see on television and despite the, you know, what they try to hammer into us, you know, that they're in complete control, the fact is that all around this country, there are people uh, in, in small towns all over this country who are protesting against the war, who are trying to do something for homeless people, doing something for the rights of women, doing something for the environment. I mean, no, these people don't appear on television. You don't hear about them. You don't read about them, but they're, they're there. Uh, there's an enormous number of people in this country who care about, about the world and about the country, who want to do something about it, and, uh, and those numbers are going to grow so long as people persist you know, and don't give up. Uh, and uh, uh, I will, uh, well, I'm trying to decide whether I should uh, read this poem. Not mine. I would never read a poem of mine. <laughs> Not if I wanted people to hang around, you see. But, uh, but the reason I, I, I plucked this poem uh, off my desk this afternoon was because I, I realized I was speaking to this wonderful group of people who are working for the homeless, the spare change people. You know, they the talk about persistence. You know, you walk the streets. And, and day after day after day after day, you see them uh, selling spare change, and you see the editors putting out this remarkable newspaper. 
with, with wonderful writing in it and, the, and the giving a picture of life in this country, a picture that you don't get you know, in the major media of real people and how they live and what they're, what they're going through. But the reason I picked this out is because uh, one was written uh, by a friend of mine, <laughs> and, uh, um, and of Norm's too, Daniel Berrigan, Father Daniel Berrigan, uh, you know, that anti-war, anti-military priest who uh, done amazing things. But the reason he wrote this poem in dedication to a person, Mitch Snyder, who worked in Washington, D.C. for a long time for homeless people in Washington, D.C. He worked uh, year after year after year, and, and he felt desperate about the situation, and he succumbed to it, and he took his own life. And Dan Verigan wrote this poem uh, in memory of Mitchell Snyder. Uh, Some stood up once and sat down. Some walked a mile and walked away. Some stood up twice, then sat down. I've had it, they said. Some walked two miles, then walked away. It's too much, they cried. Some stood and stood and stood. They were taken for fools. They were taken for being taken in. Some walked and walked and walked. They walked the earth, they walked the waters, they walked the air. Why do you stand, they were asked, and why do you walk? Because of the children, they said, and because of the heart, and because of the bread. Uh, and uh, because the cause, the cause is the heart's beat, and the children born, and the risen bread. Thank you. title for today's meeting, the first thing that came to mind was a line in the Analects uh, where they define, where Confucius defines uh, the exemplary person, meaning the master himself. And the exemplary person is the person who goes on even though he knows there is no hope. Well, we're not exemplary people, so we don't have to face that kind of challenge. Uh, we have to face the challenge of going on when we know there is hope, and there's plenty of hope. I entirely agree with Howard when he says that we can take off today from uh, a higher plane than has been the case in the past. There is, over time, a regular cycle of activism, achievement, uh, repression, uh, uh, apparent failure, uh, more activism, more repression, and so on. Uh, but it's not a, the cycle doesn't stay in the same place. It constantly goes upwards. It may feel difficult to believe that if at any, at any time, when you look at the current circumstances, but if you look over time, it is pretty clear that it's going upwards. We start from a higher plane and uh, easier uh, stand uh, at every time that we go on, knowing that there is hope. Uh, I wasn't entirely happy about the word desperation in the title. I don't think it's the term desperate time suggests that there's nothing you can do about it, which is certainly wrong. There's a great deal you can do about it. Uh, in fact, more than in the past. Uh, ominous times would be correct. It's very ominous times. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the first time it, it, it's probably, in some respects, the most ominous time in, in human history, or for that matter, in world history. The, uh, if you take a look at a very sober, respectable journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which isn't given to uh, exaggerated rhetoric, if you open the current issue, which just appeared, there's an article by two highly reputable uh, strategic analysts uh, who also are not given to hyperbole and exaggeration uh, who say, that, who are discussing the uh, uh, current uh, plans for transformation of the American military system. 
which most people don't read, but they're worth reading. You can find them in the Air Force Space Command plans on the internet and elsewhere. And they go through them and they point out that these plans are raising a, a very high probability, a likelihood of what they call ultimate doom. And that's what we're facing, ultimate doom if these plans continue. Well, that's ominous. It's not exaggerated. It's, it's real. Uh, we're moving right towards it. Uh, the, uh, the Bush administration is, uh, these are things that people don't pay much attention to. The administration is planning uh, to uh, put the first phase of so-called missile defense in operation uh, within a few weeks. Uh, we may not pay attention, but intelligence agencies around the world do, in China, Russia, and elsewhere. They know perfectly well that missile defense is an offensive weapon. It's a first strike weapon. They're taking means to counter it, uh, significant and dangerous means, and those means threaten all of us, uh, as does the rapid continual expansion of this uh, unilateral uh, 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 attempt on the part of the United States, uh, more than an attempt, unfortunately, to militarize space and to uh, uh, create the possibility of instantaneous uh, devastating attack anywhere in the world without warning. Uh, others are not going to just sit there and say, cut my throat. Uh, the reactions are coming, and yes, it does lead to ultimate doom. So desperate times may be wrong, but ominous times is certainly right. Uh, what about the uh, uh, going back to hope? Uh, well, if I can intrude a little bit on Howard's turf, uh, a look at history really is very helpful. Uh, so this is by no means the first time that uh, there has been a feeling that somehow, you know, hopeless, things are over, can't do anything, no alternatives, uh, end of history. Uh, those phrases which are common today are, are very familiar. Uh, so I'll go back to say the late 19th century uh, when there was an, among elites a great uh, euphoria, uh, joy about the fact that uh, the end of history had come and the things were all over, they'd reached the final stage of society. Utopia, the masters, nothing more can be done about it. Well, at that time in uh, England, at, uh, in Oxford, uh, the famous uh, artist and uh, socialist writer and activist William Morris uh, shocked an audience at Oxford by giving a talk in which he said that uh, uh, resistance is possible. Uh, he said that uh, uh, I know that the received opinion is that we have reached perfection and finality and there, there is no alternative to the current uh, system of uh, uh, the current competitive uh, devil take the hindmost system. That's the last system on earth and nothing can replace it. It's perfection, finality, end of history. Uh, he said, however, if that is true, if history is ending in this system, then civilization will die. And I refuse to believe that civilization will die, uh, despite the uh, uh, confident uh, pronouncements of the most learned men. That's William Morris, almost verbatim. Actually, I quoted it, but unfortunately left a piece of paper where I wrote it down at home. So that's my rendition of it, almost exact. Uh, well, it turned out he was, he was mocked and jeered and so on, but he was right. Uh, shortly after he spoke, there was another one of the periodic revivals of uh, activism, organizing, uh, very, led to very significant results. Uh, the world 10 or 20 years later was quite different in England and the United States, to uh, some extent elsewhere, uh, because of the refusal of people to uh, agree that uh, we had reached finality and perfection and that uh, 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 history must end and civilization must die. Well, that led to the predictable repression, a uh, wave of repression was led primarily by what's called the left in our uh, spectrum of, uh, narrow spectrum of political leadership by Woodrow Wilson, famous for Wilsonian idealism. Uh, part of it was the, the Red Scare after World War I, 
it is much more severe than anything that's happening now, incomparably more so. And it did, uh, with the support of uh, business, of course, and the media, uh, it did crush uh, labor and uh, uh, crush independent thought. And through the 1920s, once again, uh, talk about confident talk about the end of history, finality, perfection, utopia, the masters, nothing you can do, we've won. Uh, and then along came the 1930s and the country blew up, came pretty close to a revolution, in fact, very close. Uh, the, there were many achievements uh, that grew out of the activism, very significant ones. Uh, after this break during the Second World War, immediately afterwards came a period of repression. Uh, it's called McCarthyism, but that's very misleading. McCarthy was a kind of marginal figure and uh, uh, the only reason he became famous is because he went after powerful people and you're not allowed to do that and they quickly destroyed him. Uh, but uh, it was much more serious and widespread than that. And through the 1950s, it did appear that there, there was a period of uh, what was considered a period of quiescence and apathy and obedience. It's not exactly accurate, but that was the picture and the sense. Uh, at that time, the phrase wasn't <clears throat> end of history, it was end of ideology. Uh, we had reached the perfect society. Uh, all that was needed, no changes were needed anymore. Everything was in place. Uh, all that had to be done was a little tinkering around the edges by uh, uh, technocratic intellectuals, they were called smart guys at Harvard and so on, uh, and, and that would take care of everything. Then came the 60s country exploded again. Uh, turns out there was no end of ideology and no end of history. And uh, uh, massive changes took place. In fact, this just changed the country enormously in many, many respects, uh, very much for the better, in fact. That led to the predicted wave of repression, begins in the early 70s. Uh, there was enormous concern among elites, again, liberal elites particularly, about what they called the crisis of democracy. Uh, the crisis of democracy is the fact that uh, normally passive and apathetic uh, sectors of the population, like young people and women and old people and farmers and workers, this kind of marginal sectors, uh, were becoming uh, uh, active and engaged and entering the political arena where they don't belong. Uh, that belongs to the corporate elite. Everyone else is supposed to shut up and uh, follow orders. Uh, so that was called a crisis of democracy, an excess of democracy, which had to be overcome with more moderation in democracy. Uh, and along comes the anticipated wave of repression. We're right in the middle of it, in fact. It's a long, continuing one. And one of the reasons it's long and continuing is it hasn't worked. Uh, it's different from the others. Uh, a lot has worked. So for example, if you take a look at the early 70s, there's a huge increase, huge increase in the number of corporate lobbyists in Washington to try to make sure that Congress isn't affected by the crisis of democracy, that it doesn't pay attention to the wrong voices, like those people who are supposed to shut up, uh, only to the right voices. Uh, there's a, a, in, a sudden rise of uh, uh, very well-funded, very dedicated, and often quite vicious uh, right-wing foundations, uh, which were determined to shift the spectrum of, a, of opinion way off to the right. Already was pretty far, but make sure it goes very far. Cut off everything at the other end, that's had its effects. Uh, the international and domestic economic systems underwent changes, important ones. Uh, which were largely designed to undercut the threat of democracy and have indeed had that effect. Uh, there was uh, uh, one of the concerns over uh, the crisis of democracy was uh, the failure, I'm quoting now, the failure of the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Again, I'm quoting from the liberals, the crisis of democracy. The institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young weren't doing their job. The schools, universities, churches, uh, young people were thinking for themselves, they were acting for themselves, uh, uh, choosing their own ways, that's not appropriate. So they had to be tightened up, there's been a big effort to do that. 
uh, bitter and vicious repression abroad was part of this. And uh, we're in the midst of that phase. Uh, but as I said, it was limited uh, dr throughout this entire period. Since the 60s, the crisis of democracy has gotten worse. Uh, the popular movements uh, that have made a major change in American society, and in fact, world society, because these phenomena are worldwide. Uh, those are mostly uh, movements that developed in the 70s or the 80s or even the 90s. Uh, the feminist movement, for example, has changed enormously. Uh, patterns of understanding, uh, belief, commitment, practices, and so on. The effects have been very substantial, but that's a movement of the 70s. Had it roots in the 60s, but barely existed then. Uh, Howard mentioned uh, Mitch Snyder, uh, who a homeless, the homeless activist who was so desperately committed suicide, and now there's a homeless empowerment movement. Long way to go, a lot of achievement. The environmental movement didn't exist in the 60s. Now there are massive popular movements that are concerned with the problem of trying to preserve uh, an environment in which our children and grandchildren can survive. Now, the anti-nuclear movement developed mainly in the 1980s and became huge. Well, the main historian of it, Lawrence Whitner, describes it correctly as uh, the most important anti-terrorist uh, uh, development in history. That's true, it's a fair description, and it had its effect. Uh, the uh, solidarity movements of the 1980s were something completely new in European history. I mean, there had never been a time in the past when an, a European, include the United States and Europe, a European country, a Western imperial country, uh, when citizens of that country uh, actually went uh, to join the victims of imperialist wars to help them, to protect them by their white faces and that sort of thing. Uh, tens of thousands of people did that in the 1980s, right from mainstream in the United States. Uh, it's now spread to other places. Uh, that's a dramatic new development. In the 1990s, uh, there are completely new uh, movements have arisen. Uh, the global, global justice movement, what is kind of ludicrously called the anti-globalization movement, uh, has created a form of international solidarity that never existed in the past. I mean, the left and the working class movements back from their origins in the 19th century uh, were all, always hoped to become international movements. That's why every labor uh, union is called an international. None of them were internationals. There were organizations called internationals, the first, second, third, fourth international, but not only were they not international, they were mostly small elite groups. Uh, but now there are the seeds of a real international for the first time ever. Uh, international movements, uh, meetings all over the world, spawning local movements uh, here, everywhere else. Uh, of an enormous scale, uh, working for, uh, dedicated to really changing uh, uh, the institutional structures that are oppressive and the core, uh, lie behind the uh, acts of repression and violence that take place. All of that's new. Uh, it goes side by side with uh, increasing efforts at uh, repression and violence and so on, and moves that uh, do really threaten ultimate doom. Uh, those phrases are not an exaggeration, uh, but it's a complicated picture. And it means that uh, the efforts of people who do want to go on when they know there's plenty of hope, they don't have to be as exemplary as Confucius, uh, their efforts can uh, take place, begin uh, not from the beginning, but from on the basis of substantial uh, achievements that uh, uh, have really broken new ground, opened new ways, uh, and offer plenty of opportunity to people who want to go on, carry it forward, uh, become engaged, uh, involved with ample reason for hope and more than enough reason to continue. Maybe while people are collecting their thoughts, um, I'll certainly 
ask a question. Um, you know, spare change is part of a small, struggling, developing international media movement. There's 100 street papers in 27 countries on six continents around the world. And we're trying to figure out how to work together. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the changes in media, kind of both the concentration of the mainstream media and then the explosion of lots of alternative media. And so many people say, well, the mainstream media doesn't cover this or doesn't cover that. But you know, what is it that alternative media can be doing um, especially when there's such a, so many alternative medias. People have so many options now to read. <laughs> Can we move this over to the table? That's, 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 don't move that, that's the, the uh, mic. Howard, Howard he's lazy, he doesn't want to stand up. <laughs> the, no, I, no, no, I, no I'm, I just want to tell you this. This is a guy who has written about the media. <laughs> again and again and again. I mean, read, you know, Manufacturing Consent, right? I mean, that's what it's about. It's a great book, even though no one wrote it. <laughs> Actually, I, I was the second author of that, remember? It's our friend Edward Herman who initiated it. Uh, well, um, I, I think what's happening to the media is a pretty good example of what we were both talking about. There are parallel developments. Uh, there is uh, one tendency is towards concentration of the media, narrowing of the options, uh, uh, increasing uh, concentration on domination and control. It's not just a matter of controlling opinions. It's a matter of driving people from infancy, in fact, into kind of mindless consumerism. Uh, it was recognized you know, almost 100 years ago in the big US, the main, the world's main propaganda agency was being formed, the public relations industry, uh, that you couldn't control people by force anymore. There too much freedom had been won in England and the United States. So huge propaganda industries developed to, uh, committed to controlling people's uh, attitudes and behavior. And there may, you take a look at the business literature in say the 19, 18, 1920s, uh, and you find uh, emphasis on creating what they called a philosophy of futility uh, at a concentration on, I'm quoting it now, on the superficial things of life like fashionable consumption. And since then, you know, trillions of dollars have been spent and enormous energies have been created to trying to create strange copies of human beings uh, who see themselves and their value and their opportunities solely in amassing the commodities that uh, they're told they want, uh, what are called created wants in the industry. And again, it begins with infants. If you, I sometimes watch TV with my grandchildren and uh, it's mind-boggling. But uh, so yeah, that's, that's a large part of the media. Concentration, uh, uh, more and more effort and control, uh, narrowing opportunities for discussion and so on. Yeah, it's obvious why it goes on. Uh, there's a counter tendency. Uh, the development of a great array of what are sometimes called alternative media. I don't particularly like the word because it suggests that the others have some special priority and they don't. Uh, so there is a big growth of independent media and it's uh, used very creatively and constructively. Just about everything that's going on these days, uh, information, activism, interaction among people, organizing, planning, it involves the independent media. A lot of it involves the internet. Uh, journals like uh, Spare Change and others, these are proliferating all over the place. Uh, they have an enormous outreach. They need plenty of help. Uh, they don't get funded by uh, you know, the big corporations or the Pentagon. So they have, to, like every other popular movement in history, they depend on the participants to overcome by their mass, you know, what can be done with concentration of wealth and power. But they're there, we all know they're there, and they're having a big effect. And these tendencies are in parallel, uh, which is, uh, has uh, plenty of, offers enormous opportunities and reasons for hope. We know where to go to expand these institutions, help them flourish, uh, uh, become more effective and active 
That's up to those who want to participate. Uh, let me just add a little to what Noam has said about alternative media. Um, and I'm sure he's had the same ex experience I have. And that is, there are a lot of small radio stations around the country. I mean, sure, there's, you know, there's Radio Pacifica, there's Democracy Now. But aside from that, uh, I, I remember a few years ago, they had a conference here in Boston that had 200 community radio stations represented. Now, you know, and uh, and they, they do a remarkable job. You know, they, they're not ABC, NBC, but they, they reach people in some of the most remote areas of the country, uh, and, uh, you know, they do very well. And, and of course, there's David Barsamian with uh, oh, this amazing guy, does something called alternative radio, and what he does is he uh, records interviews and speeches. Half of them are by Noam. <laughs> <laughs> And the other half, I don't know who they're by, but, but he records these speeches, the lecture, Barbara Ehrenreich, Michael Moore, yeah, there are other people, and uh, records these things and records interviews, and then he sends it out via satellite. And any radio station in the country can pick it up if it wants, and, and a bunch of them do. And I get, uh, I get calls from radio stations, not and it, very often, and these are not alternative radio stations, I get calls from sort of, you might say, regular radio stations. And I, I guess they want to have the fun of having a dissident voice on their station. And so I do a telephone interview with sometimes a right-wing radio station, you know, in Cicero, Illinois, you know. And, and <laughs> 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 Are you from Cicero? <laughs> Around there, Illinois. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I'm always happy when I, I'm always happy when they call me. You know, it's a great opportunity to talk to a terrible audience, <laughs> to talk to people who listen to really nonsense all day long. You know, and uh, and so I'm. Uh, and you know, there are there are black radio stations around the country, and there's a very distinct difference between the black radio stations and the other radio stations. Uh, and I'm talking now. I mean, the black radio stations are not considered alternative; they're not part of Pacifica or anything like that. But their political viewpoint is very, very different than the orthodox political viewpoint. And some uh, a black radio station in Washington, D.C. that interviews me from time to time, and, and uh, the guy asks me questions, and uh, I, I don't really have to give answers, because his questions are like all rhetorical. <laughs> like, let's say, Do, don't you think that behind the war in Iraq is oil? <laughs> 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 so I, I'm left with like one word answers, you see. <laughs> yeah, and it's a call-in show. And I remember that right after Colin Powell gave his famous speech to the UN telling how many weapons of mass destruction, remember, uh, that Saddam Hussein had, very impressive. I mean, the New York Times was impressed. The Washington Post was impressed. All these supposedly very intelligent people in the major media were very impressed. Because you say, he was telling you exactly how many gallons, you know, of uh, chemical stuff they had and, you know, where, you know, well, it all turned out to be lies, right? It all turned out to be lies. And, but right after, he, right after he gave that speech, and everybody was so impressed, and I was on this black radio station in Washington, D.C., and it was a call-in show, and six different people called in, and very clearly black people, after living in the South for a bunch of time, uh, there's a little difference, <laughs> and you can actually pretty much tell. You say, and the, yeah, but the, not only was it a black radio station, but these were black people calling in, and they were all denouncing Colin Powell. I thought, oh, Colin Powell, you know, he's one. No, they were denouncing Colin Powell, and uh, and and saying that he was, you know, he was part of the Bush machine, and they didn't believe him. And uh, it was very refreshing, you know, to know that you know these kind of uh, voices could be heard. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I'll just say one more thing. 
and that is that there are, new, there are uh, aside from alternative newspapers, there are actually columnists on regular newspapers around the country who are daring enough to uh, say what their editorial policies will not say. I was in recently in Athens, Georgia. Now, if any of you know anything about Athens, Georgia, it's not the most, how can I say it? Not, not the most politically uh, progressive place in the United States. When I was living in Atlanta, Athens was the, known as the seat of the Confederacy, you know. But I, when I was in Athens, Georgia, and there I discovered that there's a guy who writes for the main newspaper in Athens, Georgia, uh, a guy named Ed Tant, writes a radical column in this newspaper. I mean, it would, his columns would sort of make both me and Noam rear back a little. You know, just too much, you know. Uh, uh, but there he is d doing this. And, and I get a regular column from a, some guy up in Gloucester who writes for the Gloucester newspaper. And he writes wonderful, wonderful. There are people all over the country who have sort of made their way into, even into the major media. And so it, it's good to know that, you know, such voices exist. Don't forget Radio Free Man. That, oh, and we, Noam has reminded me, if we didn't mention this, that would be the end of our public career. <laughs> Radio Free Maine. <laughs> hmm? What's that? WZBC in yeah. Boston. ZBC yeah, in Boston? WZBC in Boston. Boston College, we do two hours of progressive programming on Saturdays. Oh. Sounds of Dissent, and oh. four hours on Sundays, and Democracy Now! on weekdays. ZBC. These are the folks that took over for Martin Boker when he left. This oh, place. I didn't know Martin Boker had left. <laughs> but I'm glad to come here to get the latest news. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But. Uh, yeah. And uh, more questions? Actually, one little note on the, uh, all those radio stations that you're talking about are available on the internet if you want to go out and find them and listen to them. Start with Pacifica and go from there. There's some wonderful sources of information. But then my real question is uh, about all the quote unquote natural disasters that can happen in the last month or so, all the, the hurricanes to Florida and the Caribbean. And that's one thing. First reaction maybe in the newspapers these days, folks all this going to hopeless things we're talking about. And but what are quote unquote natural disasters are really there's a lot of human intervention and preparing for them and responding to them that uh, can make all the difference in the world. And you can point to the example of what happened. Cuba took as serious a hit as any other country in the or or the United States and they moved some close to two million people out of the way, and uh, there were very few, few deaths, a lot of in, uh, damage, but very few deaths. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. It also tells you something about our media, because although Cuba was right in the path of the worst hurricanes and was taking the main hit, you, um, occasionally a newscaster would say, well, uh, I, the hurricane is passing by Havana or something, and that was about the end of that story. Uh, but uh, pretty, it's pretty dramatic to compare what happened with a series of major hurricanes in Cuba and what happened with a heavy rainstorm in Haiti. Uh, when the latest disaster hit Haiti, which may mean thousands of deaths, uh, that was actually a tropical storm. Uh, reminded, I have a daughter who lives in Managua, and when uh, Hurricane Mitch came and caused a huge disaster in Nicaragua, uh, she told us when we were able to communicate again that uh, she had lived in Seattle, and she said if this had happened in Seattle, we would have called it a heavy rainstorm. Uh, but in uh, Nicaragua, it was devastating. Uh, the uh, uh, I'll come back to Haiti in a minute, but after Hurricane Mitch, that was 1998, uh, which 
just killed again hundreds or maybe thousands of people living up in mountainsides, which uh, dying in mudslides and so on. It's pretty striking to see what happened. There's a big volcano in near in Nicaragua where people had were in fact living up on the mountainside and mud and trying to survive and. I forget how many, maybe certainly hundreds died in mudslides. Uh, just a couple of miles away, the, there's a big plantation run by a conglomerate, the Florida Cana Foundation uh, conglomerate that produces rum. They did great in the hurricane. Uh, they have good land, uh, well, you know, and, and the heavy rains just uh, increased their crop, uh, not on the mountainside. The main, uh, the journal of the uh, Jesuit University in uh, Nicaragua, which has a very good economic section, they described it as a neoliberal disaster. Uh, what they pointed out is that the, it's not that God is trying to harm Nicaragua, it's that the planners of the international economic system are creating a system in which the poor will suffer and be destroyed. They are driven up to the mountainsides because there's no because they can't survive. They cut down the trees because they need charcoal. Uh, the water doesn't get absorbed, uh, and if anything happens, like a heavy rain, total disaster. Well, that's what happened in Haiti, not in Cuba, but in Haiti. Uh, in Haiti, there were. Uh, in the areas most heavily hit, there had been hurricane warning, storm warning centers, uh, relief centers, some of them actually funded by USAID even. Uh, they were all wiped out during the coup a couple of, couple of months ago, US-backed coup, which got rid of the government and instituted a government of gangsters and killers. And among the effects was to wipe out the support system. Uh, there's a long history in Haiti uh, f for which France had the initial responsibility and we have the later responsibility for the past century, which has simply wiped the place out. Uh, it's it's uh, questionable whether it'll even survive another generation or two. If any of you have been there and flown into Haiti, you know when you fly in, uh, it's half the island. Uh, one half of the island is green, the other half of the island is brown. Uh, not because people don't work hard, or not because they're not trying, but because they've been strangled, uh, viciously attacked and strangled for a major crime that they carried out in 1804, and nobody will ever forgive them for it. In 1804, they became the first free country in the hemisphere, uh, free country of free men, to be precise, but the first one, and that they will never be forgiven for. We're still. Uh, France practically destroyed them as a result. Uh, huge debt was imposed, uh, indemnities were imposed for the crime of liberating themselves. Uh, took, uh, never paid it off. The last president was just driven out, uh, President Aristide, uh, requested politely that France might eliminate the interest on the debt from 1825, and he was, of course, just dismissed with ridicule. Part of the reason why France supported the overthrow. Uh, the United States was the harshest country for very good, obvious reasons. The United States was terrified about the uh, Haitian Revolution. Here's a free country, the first free country, um, right next door in a slave state. Uh, that's a terrible model. Uh, the U.S. immediately moved to strangle them uh, after it became a major power. It sort of took over. It's, uh, there have been more U.S. interventions in Haiti in this uh, last century than any other country. And it's, uh, it has been, again, Woodrow Wilson uh, was responsible for an invasion which uh, uh, left the Marines there for almost 20 years, killed, we don't count our victims, but probably according to Haitian historians, maybe 15, 20,000 people reinstituted virtual slavery. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was then a secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy, took credit, whether he did it or not, I don't know, nobody knows, but he took credit for uh, rewriting uh, the Haitian Constitution, which was forced down their throats after the Marines disbanded the parliament because it refused to accept the U.S. In, a, a written constitution, and the reason was because it provided the constitution that the U.S. wrote, which Roosevelt took credit for, uh, allowed the takeover of Haitian lands by U.S. corporations. 
Well, the Haitian parliament didn't want to accept that, so they were sent out at gunpoint. Uh, new parliament was voted in with, I think, 99% of the vote, 5% of the population participating, lots of cheers. An American corporation could buy up the land. When the Marines finally left, they left it in the hands of a brutal, vicious National Guard. Uh, I won't go through the rest of the story, but it remains equally horrible up to the present, right through Clinton. Uh, so yeah, the country's devastated. Uh, that's not a natural disaster. That's a human disaster. Whoever raised the question is quite accurate. It's a human disaster, the result of human planning, uh, predictable, consequences are predictable. The people who do it, do it with eyes open, and you get uh, neoliberal disasters in uh, Managua, you get uh, devastating uh, uh, disasters in Haiti, again, probably a couple thousand killed, uh, not because of uh, the climate, not because the climate is awful. Climate's also awful in Cuba, and it didn't happen. Maybe I can talk loud enough without it. <laughs> you can, Alex. <laughs> just want to, uh, first for my question, just comment on uh, uh, Dr. Zen's comment about blacks and their public opinions. It turns out that blacks, minorities, Latinos tend to have opinions that are much more consistent with international world opinion than do white Americans. White Americans on a lot of questions like race, uh, abortion, and Nixon or Bush are just off the chart in comparison to the rest of the world. But the Latinos, blacks, etc., tend to have a much more international viewpoint on those items. My question was, what do you think about the uh, Dan Rather? Uh, why was it so well known or why is it even important? <laughs> You know, what, yeah, while other people were watching the news on television about Dan Rather, I was watching the Red Sox. <laughs> but frankly, all, all that whole business, you know, of military records, I mean, that's what Raya said it's all about. Wow, what a terrible thing, you know, the forged documents about, who cares? I, really, I mean, it's an enormous diversion. The whole business of Kerry boasting about his military prowess, Bush trying to say that, uh, <laughs> trying to, to, in some way, sort of rescue his pitiful military record, <laughs> you know, by by turning attention to uh, phony documents. It, it's all a diversion from the real issues of, of what's going on in the campaign, you know. I, I don't care about the military records of presidents, really. Sure, privately, <laughs> you know, well, no. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, I mean, I don't care that Kerry was a military hero. You know, What I care about these guys is what are they doing today about the war? That's what I care about, whatever their military record is. I don't want Kerry to boast about his military heroism. I want him to, if he is going to boast, I want him to boast about the time he stood up against the war, you see. That's what he should be doing today. That's what he should be emphasizing, you see, instead of dealing with, you know, who, who was uh, more heroic or less heroic in the war. So the whole Dan Rather thing, yeah, I turned to the Red Sox, yeah. <laughs> Since then, and being politically active is what keeps me hopeful, aside from history. And another point I wanted to make is, aside from the internet and wonderful newspapers and uh, radio stations, we do have local access cable TV. And this summer, I was up in New Hampshire at a place called World Fellowship, and I saw a movie that both of you were in called Liberty Bound. Was done by <laughs> Christine Rose interviewed both of you, and I don't think it's done yet. It's a wonderful film about 9/11 and its aftermath, and 
I bought a copy along with a copy of another film about the militarization of space, which was horrifying. And I brought the two of them to cable community TV, and they've aired five times in the past two weeks. Also, the um, one about the um, militarization of space has been airing. And I have another copy that I'm taking to Boston Neighborhood Network TV, and I hope I will, I'm sure I'll have the same result that they'll show it many times. And I've already received um, information from Eli at CCTV saying that people had contacted him and said, wow, that was a great film. It had information in it that I never saw before. And they wanted information about how to get the film. So I just want to put in a plug for using your local uh, cable TV stations. And Democracy Now! and Amy Goodman's on Channel 9 in Cambridge. It's great. Uh, that's a very important point, and it ought to be a point of self-criticism for the activist movement. Uh, we really, I mean, there's a lot of criticism of the media and how awful they are and so on and so forth, and I do it too, and it's all correct. Uh, but it's not that we can't do anything about it. We have tremendous facilities available to us which we simply aren't using. Uh, when Congress passed the cable, um, whatever the act was back in the early 70s, which granted monopolies to cable companies all over the place, they were compelled by public pressure to uh, insist to ensure that the cable companies and who have the monopoly in some area would put up a uh, community cable station. Now, you know, by the standards of most of the world, those stations are magnificent. You know, the, uh, the CBS studios, but they have tremendous facilities, and they're very little used. Uh, they're available. Anybody can use them. You know, a, a lot of what comes over them is just junk. That's only because nobody is there saying, I want to put something on. When people like you uh, give them things that they can put on, they do it. And that can reach a tremendous number of people. In fact, reaches pretty near everybody. Uh, everybody who has cable in some area can get it. Uh, and we just don't use them. And it's, it's amazing to see what people do who don't have resources. Like one of the most remarkable experiences I had related to media was in Brazil, uh, in a huge slum outside of Rio, millions of people. Uh, very, Brazil's, the poverty in Brazil is extreme. Uh, they, they, they had developed a uh, public television system which consisted of a truck that was driven in from the city by a few activist media professionals that had a screen on top and some equipment inside. And it's a sort of semi-tropical country, so everybody's outside, especially because the living conditions are so impossible. Uh, and right at prime time, television time, you know, 9 p.m., everybody in the area is out in the village, in the town center, you know, the plaza, uh, families, uh, people, and the truck comes in and the screen goes up, and they were playing programs. Uh, written, directed, and acted by local people in the community. Now, uh, you know, I don't know Portuguese, but uh, enough to be able to follow. Uh, some of them were comical skits and things like that. A lot of them were quite serious. Uh, they were about uh, the debt crisis, uh, about AIDS, about racism, other things. And it was interactive. I mean, there was a young woman, maybe 17 or 18, looked like that to me. My age, she was maybe 30, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, the uh, uh, younger than my daughter, that's all I know. She uh, uh, was acting in the programs, and uh, during, in, the, in between the skits, she would walk around the crowd, you know, people in the square, people sitting in a bar nearby, uh, whatever, uh, with a microphone. And I guess somebody must have had a television camera behind her or something. Uh, and she would ask people their opinion about what they just saw, and they'd comment on it, and it would be shown on the screen on top of the truck, and other people would react to them, and you know, dis discussion would go on among the group. Um, that's people with no facilities at all. You know? uh, and uh, look what we don't do with the enormous facilities available to us. 
Uh, these are things that are worth thinking about. I think whoever said it is very right to bring it up. Uh, about, well, a week ago Sunday, I taped uh, Bernie Sanders, the socialist congressman from Vermont, and he talked about how he's going to vote for Kerry. This spring, I taped Sam Webb, chairman of the Communist Party, and he talked about how he's going to vote for Kerry. And of course, this is pretty much like our two speakers, Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn, who said they're probably going to vote for Kerry. Or they're going to vote against Bush, but maybe that's a good time to clear all this up. Would you care to make a statement? Uh, no one will clear it up for you, Roger. Well, I think I'm speaking for Howard. You tell me if I'm wrong. But my impression is that we both said the same thing, and it was in fact the same thing we said in the year 2000, uh, namely that in swing states, uh, unless you are in favor of ultimate doom uh, and uh, eliminating the limited medical system that exists and destroying Social Security, and we can give a long list of other things. Unless you're in favor of those consequences, you should vote against Bush in a swing state. In a safe state, you have other choices. The choices include abstention, which makes perfect sense. Uh, there's a reason why both political parties make huge efforts, and the whole propaganda system makes enormous efforts to try to bring people out to vote. Uh, they don't care how they vote, just vote. The reason is it's part of the mode of depolitization, making people believe that politics is a matter of showing up once every four years in a personalized extravaganza in which there are no issues. I mean, if that can be driven into people's heads, yeah, you control people. So one way of objecting to that is abstention, uh, which makes sense in a safe state. And then there are other options. You pick somebody you want to vote for. Uh, but that's uh, quite different than saying vote for Kerry wherever you are. And I think, as far as I know, Howard has been perfect. I think this is your opinion, yeah. And I've certainly been very clear about it. So uh, the, there's a lot of rumors going around. Uh, one of the reasons for the rumors going around is that many people on the left are also caught up in the propaganda about uh, quadrennial personalized extravagances being politics. So they become obsessed with this issue. I mean, it's a pretty marginal issue. You know, real political activism is going to go on, it ought to go on seriously day after day, wherever you are, on the important issues, uh, whatever you decide to do on uh, November or whatever it is when you push a lever. Uh, what you ought to do for those five minutes, and it's about all the attention it deserves, uh, in my opinion, and I think Howard's is, well, you know, if it's going to make a, if you're going to help keep Bush out, you should do it. If it's not, do something else. Uh, but it shouldn't be an obsession. That's just part of the way of depoliticizing people. That's not the way politics works. I mean, what we would like to do is create a democratic culture in which you don't have just that choice. And it's not you know, some idealistic dream. Other countries have it. So take the second largest country. I mean, just take a look at what's going on. I mean, if somebody's observing this hemisphere from, say, Mars, uh, they, they've been, they'd be appalled. I mean, in the biggest, richest country in the world, there's a thing called an election in which the choice is between two men born to wealth and political power, went to the same elite university, joined the same secret society where they were trained in the manners of the upper classes, uh, those of you who went to Harvard and so on know how it works. Uh, especially when you're in the secret society. They're able to run because they're funded by the same concentrations of private power. Uh, in the election, it's, which is run mainly by the PR industry, uh, it's critically important to keep away from issues and to emphasize qualities. And they tell you that, and they do it. So people don't even know where the candidates stand on issues if they it takes a research project to figure out what one of them is trying to say about health care, if it's anything. Uh, uh, and in fact, if you take a look at the polls, uh, what you're supposed to be concerned with is uh, leadership, you know, um, is he a nice guy? Would I like to leave, read him, you know, uh, meet him at a bar? I mean, the big thing about whether Kerry goes windsurfing while Bush drives a 
pickup truck with a hoe over his, over his shoulder or something like that. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to worry about, but not issues. And it shows, uh, the latest Gallup poll, they come out once a week, uh, when they asked people uh, why they were voting, those who had decided to vote, it turned out that issues on issues was like around 10%. And part of the reason is nobody knows the position of the candidates on issues, and you're not supposed to know because it's none of your business. You know, <laughs> issues are supposed to be taken care of by someone else, okay? And uh, we should not be caught up in that. Uh, other countries are not like that. So take the second biggest country in the hemisphere, Brazil, again. Uh, you know, th there was big excitement when Barack Obama said at the Democratic Convention, you know, only in the United States could someone like me appear to speak in a convention. Well, you know, it's, I think his father's a lawyer, his mother's a, well, some other professional. Uh, and he, yeah, he was able to speak in the convention, that's nice. But in the second biggest country in the hemisphere, uh, uh, the president, who happens to be a very impressive figure, never went to never had any higher education at all. His background is a peasant, a steel worker, a union organizer. Uh, he was, uh, the choice between candidates was real. Uh, he had, uh, he was able to, uh, it's somebody like that, can't, you can't even imagine him being a candidate in the United States. And the barriers against his running are far higher than here. Uh, it's a very repressive and violent state. Uh, it's uh, tremendous inequality, huge poverty, you know, tr lack, you know, a lot of people don't have formal education, just as he didn't. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the international financial community was trying in every possible way to strangle him, you know, because uh, they were dying to keep him out. But nevertheless, they won. And they won because, and he was able to run and able to win because they have a democratic culture, something which we've lost touch with. Uh, he was able to win because they have large, impressive, active, popular organization, like the Landless Workers Movement, which is the most, I think, the most important uh, popular organization in the world, uh, or the Workers' Party, or professional associations and others, and they don't consider politics just something you do every couple of years when you push a button and then you go home. They're out there every day uh, on whatever issues concern them. Uh, local, regional, international, you know, trade issues, whatever it may be. And then when it comes to the time when there's an election, they're there and they're organized and they can run their own candidate. That's a democratic culture. Uh, we don't have it. We had it. We, in, at various times, we've had some elements of it, but it has effectively significantly deteriorated. And uh, in compare, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's not reaching for the moon to say we could try to be as good as Brazil, let's say. That's uh, not, shouldn't be out of reach. Uh, just as saying that uh, we could have cable uh, community stations that are as good as the one in uh, Brazilian slums isn't reaching for the moon either. These are things we can achieve, and we're not going to achieve them by getting caught up in the propaganda about uh, uh, quadrennial uh, personalized extravaganzas that don't have any issues. Uh, those are means of marginalizing people. We should understand it. You can't ignore it, like you can't ignore a hurricane, but it shouldn't be an obsession. You do it because you have to do it, and you go on to do the important things. Anything about their personalities. And I don't know anything about them because I don't care about their personalities. I mean, maybe their wives and children do, but I don't. Uh, most of them, I think, are created figures, trained figures who are supposed to act a certain way. I should say this is not a unique opinion of mine. About 75% of the population in the United States regards elections as mostly a farce. Uh, run by the public relations industry, uh, big contributors uh, with candidates carefully trained uh, so that they project the right qualities, you know, uh, but don't, but make sure you don't understand anything about issues. Uh, so there's a measure, but all this stuff is studied with intense care. It's what political scientists do for a living. So we have a lot of data about it. It hasn't come out for this election yet, but we have it for the 2000 election. Uh, one of the measures that they study is what's called issue awareness. Uh, do you know where the candidate stands on issues that are important to you? 
and it keeps going down every year. In the year 2000, it was at a historic low, uh, along with another measure. Do you think that the government works for you? Keeps going down. Uh, and it, 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 if any of you watch the presidential debates, which I'm afraid I also didn't, uh, but if you did, you'd know exactly why. My wife actually watched them, and she's an you know, intelligent person, taught at Harvard, you know, must be some brains. She couldn't figure out where either of the candidates stood on any issue. And that's purposeful. You're not, it's not supposed to be any of your business. Uh, most of the important issues are just off the agenda altogether, the things that people care about. And those that aren't, it's just sound bites. You know? I mean, I was, I actually was, occasionally I torture myself when I'm driving home by listening to NPR and the traffic jams. And they were uh, having, actually I've gotten speedy tickets because I got so angry. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I was listening the other day and they were talking, they were talking about had some big, political scientists talking about presidential debates and how important they are. And they went through all the great moments of the presidential debates and how significant they were. And one of them was uh, Nixon-Kennedy. And that was important because Nixon hadn't shaved that day or something <laughs> like that. So that's what, that was the crucial moment in that election. Uh, another was... Uh, a, a vice presidential debate with uh, Quayle and Benson. And Quayle said, well, I've, Benson said, you haven't had much experience. And he said, well, I've had enough, as much experience as John F. Kennedy did. And then Benson said, you're no Jack Kennedy. And that won that election. You know? <laughs> and uh, then there was a question where somebody asked Dukakis, uh, if his wife was raped, would he favor the death penalty? And he gave an honest answer. He said, look, you know, it's a horrible crime. I'm terribly upset, but I'm not in favor of uh, the state having the right to kill people. And my wife, it's whether it's my wife or anyone else, the same thing. OK, that lost that election. I mean, those are the things that elections are supposed to turn on. You know, OK, that, those are all signs that it's just deeply inculcated into the educated classes, the ones who are doing this stuff and talking about it and listening to it, that democracy should not exist. It's a crime. You know, participation of the public in making decisions is a crime. The idea of it has to be wiped out of their heads, and elections have to turn on these kinds of things, like the personalities of the, you know, the crafted personalities of the uh, candidates. I mean, whether Bush really is a religious fanatic who gets his messages from God, or whether that's what he's trained to look like, is not very important. Actually, it's more dangerous if he really is. Uh, but it's bad enough if he's trained to be. And it just doesn't matter that much. Well. <laughs> There's not much for me to say after Noam speaks, you know, you realize that. Well, I'm just trying to earn my keep, you know, but they gave me an apple, a bottle of water. I have to do something in return. So I just want to say that, that uh, on this whole business of psychology, there's not only this, uh, you know, this uh, overly serious, you know, uh, psychoanalytic profiles of presidents, you know, which is ridiculous, as Noam has pointed out, you know. <laughs> you have presidents who have, whose personality is very different, whose speech is very different, who look very different. They all have the same policies. Doesn't matter, you see. But there's another aspect to it, and, and, this, uh, and, uh, and that is that very often they will psychoanalyze protesters. Do you know that? that, that uh, and uh, now, as a historian, I'm, you know, I remember, you know, I'm reading a book about the abolitionists, anti-slavery people, and this was a, a very distinguished historian who sort of psychoanalyzed the anti-slavery people. So, what was it about them and their background and their marital life, and you know, did they? breastfeed when they were kids, or what, what was it about them, you know? Uh, it never occurred to this, hist this 
you know, distinguished historian, that maybe they were just against slavery. <laughs> that you didn't have to be, there didn't have to be anything particularly different or wrong or, or odd about you psychologically in order for you to be against slavery. And, and I remember in the 1960s, there was a, another distinguished scholar, I like that word distinguished, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, who, who psychoanalyzed the, the uh, radicals of the 60s, you know. When we think about it, I mean, think of the, think of the, the radicals you have known, <laughs> you say, and ask yourself, do they all have the same kind of personality? Do they all have the same upbringing? Do their parents all treat them the same way? Do they all come from, bro from broken marriages or solid marriages? It's ridiculous, you know. Uh, people joined uh, movements because they cared about what was going on in the world. So whenever people start de talking to me about, you know, the, the, the psychological profile or the psychological background, or the, you know, and, uh, you know, did Nixon, I, I remember being uh, annoyed by Oliver Stone's film on Nixon. And Oliver Stone is one, you know, one of our most socially conscious filmmakers. But I'm not being annoyed by his film on Nixon because he seemed to be suggesting that what Nixon did in office had something to do with the way he was brought up by his parents, you know. Whenever you hear stuff like that, beware. <laughs> You're being deflected from really essential, important facts about the world. Anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of go back to the... Um November 2nd, when, uh, more importantly, sort of what happens after that. Um, one of the things that's been both awesome and sort of terrifying about the last few years is that so many people have become mobilized against the Bush administration. Uh, you know, I'm getting emails from like labor groups and gay rights groups and all sorts of people who are like, we've got to get these people out of office. Um, and Professor Chomsky, you were talking about um, this sort of culture of democracy. And I'm wondering if after November 2nd happens, regardless of what happens then, is it going to fizzle? Is there a way we can keep that going where people are still saying, hey, we need to be involved in the way our politics works? Or is it, you know, are people going to be able to sustain that? Or people, even if carry wins, people are going to sit back and go, hey, we can solve something. How do we, how do we change that? Well, I mean, that. The answer to that's really up to you. I mean, that depends whether people like you and me and so on want to live in a democratic country, like, say, Brazil, uh, or uh, whether we want to uh, be uh, passive, uh, you know, kind of machines who follow orders and we're told to go to the polls and push a lever because we're supposed to like this guy and not, you know, think I'd like to meet that guy and I wouldn't like to meet that guy, and then go home. We have the choices. I mean, if uh, it, the the act of voting, may, you know, has whatever importance it has. I mean, it's not zero. If it's going to, in my opinion, to keep Bush out is important. So if you can do something about that, it's not Bush. The people around him, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, uh, Cheney. I think those are extremely dangerous people. I don't think phrases like ultimate doom are an exaggeration. I don't think destroying. Uh, uh, safety regulations in the workplace or eliminating Social Security. I don't think those are jokes. Uh, I think they matter to people and we ought to do something about them. But that's a one-time act. You know, you do what you have to do where we are that day for half an hour, but real politics goes on. If you want to be a democratic society, like organizing labor unions or, you know, mobilizing for homeless people or, uh, you know, uh, concern about uh, ending wars and aggression and so on. If those are your interests, you do them every every day, every minute. Uh, you have to have you have to be a dedicated, committed person. It's not going to happen with uh, lever pushing, but it's. I mean, there is a major effort, huge propaganda effort, uh, to try to focus people's attention on this once every four years extravaganza. I mean, the conventions aren't conventions. You know, they're coronations. Uh, and they're played like that. Uh, and the election is purposely eliminates issues. I mean, the main issues of concern to people are just off the agenda. They don't even come up. 
I mean, it's easy to give examples if you want me to, but that's up to us whether we decide to let it happen. So let, let's take one example just to illustrate. I mean, everyone serious, pays attention, knows that there's a major domestic problem in the United States, namely the exploding costs of health care. Okay, that's a real problem. Uh, the U.S. has the most inefficient uh, health system in the industrial world by a long shot. It has the highest, by far the highest per capita expenditures and pretty poor outcomes uh, among the industrial societies, among the worst outcomes. In fact, health outcomes in the United States are approximately the same as Cuba, uh, a poor third world country that's been under terrorist attack for 45 years by the neighboring superpower and under embargoes, has the same health outcomes as the United States. I mean, that's a tragedy for here. Uh, there's, and it's not unknown what the reasons are. I mean, health professionals are pretty well aware of what the reasons are. It's a privatized system that makes it very inefficient, highly bureaucratized, tremendous amounts of supervision, a lot of paperwork. Uh, doctors may spend 40% of their time filling out forms. I mean, there was recently a study done by uh, Harvard Med School and somebody uh, in which they compared the U.S. and the Canadian systems and uh, concluded that a, I think a number was something like $300 billion a year were spent here in paperwork over and above Canada. They compared, one of the things they did in the study was compare Mass General Hospital with uh, the biggest hospital in Toronto. Uh, and uh, they compared, one of the things they compared was the billing offices. Okay, in Mass General Hospital, you know, some big wing is full of billing offices and secretaries and data processing and so on. Uh, when they tried to find it in the Toronto Hospital, uh, most people didn't know where it was, and finally they were told there's a room down in the basement, and uh, they went down to the room in the, I'm kind of making this up, but it was something like this. They went to the room in the basement, and there, were, there was a little billing office which was used for visiting, Amer visiting people from the United States. You know, well, okay, that costs, uh, just like the, super, the bureaucracy costs and the surveillance of doctors to make sure that they don't give you a prescription that maybe some bureaucrat in the insurance uh, office thinks could have been a cheaper prescription or so on and so forth. Also, the enormous power of the drug companies here just drives drug prices, you know, out of sight, way more than comparable countries. Uh, all of that costs. Uh, do people have opinions about it? Yeah, they do. Uh, last poll I saw, about 80% of the population is in favor of a national health care system. And uh, those you know, majorities or big pluralities have been going on for years. It's occasionally mentioned in the press or by commentators. And there's a phrase for it. It's called politically impossible or unrealistic or something like that. And what that means is, as a meaning, it means uh, it doesn't matter if 80% of the population wants something or if 98% of the population want it and if it's hugely important if the insurance companies and the drug companies don't like it. Uh, because if they don't like it, it's politically impossible. Well, do we have to accept that? I mean, is it kind of a law of nature that says we have to accept that? It's not coming up in the elections, you can be sure, uh, for good reasons. but. Uh, Popular activism can change that, you know, just as it, popular activism forced uh, Medicare in or Social Security and so on. It can also change this. And you've already got a big majority of the population on your side if this is what you want to be active about. But you've got to do something about it. And that means not once every four years pushing a lever. That means outworking every day. And that's just one issue, same on every other. the U.S. Constitution as this sort of infallible document. And really, our purpose as lawyers would be more um, to correctly um, understand what 
what the document is about, but there's really no question that the document itself is perfect. And I'm curious, knowing what you what you said about who made the document, what you think about it itself and its morals and that kind of thing. I'm sorry. Are you asking what, what do you think about the Constitution? <coughs> um, they're taught in the law school the Constitution is just perfect document. Who made it? How did it create it? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that's, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, because, because the Constitution, you know, it's interesting to me that in law school, here in the 21st century, they still treat the Constitution as a holy document. You know, the Constitution was, remember, put together in 1787 by 55 rich white men, you see, who, uh, were very troubled uh, by the fact that farmers in Western Massachusetts were rebelling uh, and that farmers in Virginia and New Jersey and South Carolina were in a state of rebellion and they wanted to set up a government that would be strong enough to contain rebellion and that would serve the, the interests of the elite, of the bondholders, and uh, of the slave owners and of the Western expansionists. And, they, and so they set up, and I remember we, when I was going to school, that's what they taught us, that they taught us things were chaotic before the Constitution. What they meant was that people were, were protesting. <laughs> that's what they, when people protest, then that's anarchy, that's chaos. No, they wanted uh, law and order. And in fact, if you uh, looked at the, uh, you look at the correspondence that went on at that time before the Constitution uh, was adopted and, and Shea's Rebellion had taken place in Western Massachusetts and, uh, and the one, one of the, uh, uh, the revolution had been over, right? Many of these rebe rebels were veterans of the Revolutionary War. They came back from the Revolutionary War. They'd been promised you know, that they would have a decent life and instead their, their homes and their, their farms, their livestock were being taken away from them because they couldn't pay the taxes that were levied on, on them by the Massachusetts legislature. So they were rebelling. And uh, a general from Massachusetts, Henry Knox, wrote to George Washington. They had fought together in the revolution. Uh, and he said, this was just before the Constitutional Convention. And it gives you a clue as to what the thinking was of the people who came to the Constitutional Convention, you know, to form a new government, you see. And he wrote to Washington and he said, and like, like Noam, I don't have the exact quote with me, but you can trust me. <laughs> Let's put it this way. If you can trust Noam, you can trust me. <laughs> but uh, the general said to, to Washington, he said, look here. Exact words. <laughs> George. <laughs> uh, these people think that because they fought in the revolution, that they have a right to an equal share of the wealth of this country. No way. <laughs> no way was a favorite expression of that time. <laughs> we'll say. The people, in, in fact, the, the correspondence at that, the people who came to the Constitutional Convention were determined not to have any more rebellions like Shea's Rebellion. They wanted to set up a government that would serve their class interests, and they did. And that Constitution, uh, well, how is it that the Constitution has no economic rights? How is it the, the you know, no economic rights in the Constitution? There was a reason, no right, you know, of, you know, they make a big deal of the fact we have a Bill of Rights, which was added later, right, as a result of popular demand. It was added later. But there's no economic rights in the Constitution. No, no, no right, well, no right to health care, no right to a job, no right to housing. If you don't have the right to live, the basic necessities of life, uh, then the, the other freedoms that are given to you don't amount to much. Uh, and the Constitution uh, uh, was something, and of course the Constitution established slavery and wrote into the Constitution the clause 
that uh, made it clear that fugitive slaves uh, had to be brought back and sent back to their masters in the South. The Constitution legitimized slavery. I remember that in, 19, in well, 1987, it was 200 years after the making of the Constitution. Some of you may remember that there was a celebration, bicentennial of the Constitution. Every year, of course, is a bicentennial of something, you know. And uh, the bicentennial, and there was ever a hoopla about the Constitution. Oh, the whole, that whole year, wow, what a marvelous document. In fact, Ronald Reagan, who was president, wrote an essay, believe it or not. He wrote an essay in which he said the Constitution was a, a, such a marvelous document, it could only have been framed with the guiding hand of God. That's awesome. I mean, well, that same year, during this all the celebration, there was only one voice in the upper circles of the government that had something uh, critical to say about the Constitution. And that was the one black member of the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall. And he said, what is all this hullabaloo about the Constitution? The Constitution legitimized slavery. You know, we shouldn't treat the Constitution as a holy document. Uh, and uh, the, I mean, to this day, I mean, uh, the, this whole emphasis on the Constitution, the glorification of the Constitution, uh, takes our attention away from the fact that the Constitution set up a political framework which has always kept power at the top and which has always served the interests of corporations. And even when they amended the Constitution, as they did in uh, 18. Uh, 68, when they amended the Constitution with the 14th Amendment uh, and 15th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment, uh, they amended the Constitution so that uh, now states could not, according to the 14th Amendment, could treat black people uh, in an unequal way. Uh, could, you know, could not deprive them of their equal rights before the law. And so here's the 14th Amendment. Now the Constitution is uh, presumably establishes racial equality. What happens? You know, the uh, president doesn't enforce the Constitution. For a hundred years, no president, whatever his psychology, <laughs> enforces the Constitution. No president enforces the 14th Amendment. Every president goes along with racial segregation in the South. In fact, the Supreme Court interprets the 14th Amendment to give uh, freedom and protection to corporations. Uh, and it, the Supreme Court decides that where the 14th Amendment says you cannot deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and which was presumably was supposed to mean you cannot deprive you know, uh, black people uh, without due process of, of life, liberty, property, without due process of law, the Supreme Court said, uh, it, oh, it says you cannot deprive a person. A corporation is a person. And therefore, you cannot regulate corporations. Because if you regulate corporations, you're depriving this person, the corporation, of its property. And so if you look at the number of decisions made by the Supreme Court after the 14th Amendment was passed, you find that 10 times as many decisions were made using the 14th Amendment to protect corporations as to protect black people. Anyway, uh, the, the Constitution, <laughs> uh, let me say another, let me just say something about the Constitution that is parallel to what Noam said about, about election, elections, and that is, you know, uh, the real question is, not what the Constitution says. The real question is what do people do to protect their rights? No, nothing written in the Constitution, nothing written in law will protect people's rights just because it is written there. People have always had to fight and struggle to get the rights that they needed. And the, the Constitution uh, didn't, was not critical in determining that. What was critical was uh, what people did to organize 
uh, whatever the Constitution said. So, you know, in the problem with law school <laughs> is that it gives people this romantic notion of, you know, well, what does, what does the Constitution say? What does the law say? No, the real question is, what do people do? Well, I, I would like to thank our distinguished guests. and also to thank our distinguished audience. And to remind people that we do have um, Dr. Zinn's latest book for sale outside and he will be signing copies. Thank you.